Naoki Urasawa juggled multiple serializations at the same time, frequently shifted focus away from his protagonists, defied his editors, and even went against his readers. You'll often come across mangakas who don't like being told how things are done, those who break the norms or continue doing what they believe is right despite heavy criticism. Urasawa embraces these ideas in a very unique way. He's even written his own songs in rock, a genre that became associated with rebellion and personal freedom during the decades he grew up. This video explores the behind the scenes details of Urasawa's career. I'll cover a wide range of works, but these three will have their own segment. Let's dive in. Much of the influence behind Urasawa's most popular works actually comes from before age 14. This includes the dark melancholic side to his stories. He was the type of kid who had a hard time fitting in and usually kept distant from others. His manga journey began at around age 4 or 5 when he discovered two manga volumes at his grandparents' house, Astro Boy and Kimbo the White Lion both creations of the father of manga himself, Osamu Tezuka. Urasawa became obsessed with this artist. He'd frequently copy his drawings, even signing them off as Osamu Tezuka. By age 6, he could do this. Pretty accurate depiction of Tetsujin 28. Urasawa learned most of what he knows through observing published work and experimentation. For example, patterns like these often used by Tezuka. He figured out how to imitate them when he was in elementary school, then applied it to his own drawings. Though funnily enough, he would try to hide his true skill level in school in fear of further isolating himself from other students. He wasn't always a rebel, he just wanted to fit in. In middle school, he came across two factors that influenced the bulk of his career. The first is Phoenix, also by Tezuka. It became Urasawa's new favorite manga, taking the spot from that volume of Astro Boy he had. The the second factor was Bob Dylan's music. We'll come back to this later, but Urasawa's discovery of these songs might have been the start of his shift to a nonconformist attitude. We have a fuller picture of the Tezuka influence now. When I first read Astro Boy at the age of 5, the story made me feel a feeling I had never felt before. I also read the whole series of Phoenix for the first time when I was 13. I could say that it pretty much shaped the way I think. It had a great influence on me. I guess my values were formed when I was between 5 and 13, reading Tezuka Sensei's works. Film and TV also play important roles in Urasawa's development, specifically in regards to how he depicts drama. From the works of Akira Kurosawa like Seven Samurai, to foreign films like Le Trou, a 1960s French crime film, Urasawa has brought this movie up a lot. He first watched it at age 8. It remained a film close to my heart. It's also a story that ends very badly. But every frame, every shot reminded me that this is what I wanted to do. And at that moment, I fully understood that the source of my creativity came from this film. If I learned not to create happy endings, it's thanks to French cinema. And of course, other comic artists also influenced Urusawa. For foreign creators, Mobius in particular was important. A big name in the science fiction and fantasy realm. I felt at the time that manga had become boring, so it was like I'd found an oasis in the desert. Finally, a manga that has what I like, so I used to absolutely visually devour Mobius' illustrations in Starlog. For other Japanese artists, Katsuhiro Otomo was a big one. Urasawa took notice of his work thanks to this scene from the manga Fireball. Otomo is actually just a big deal in general, revolutionizing the industry's standard for detail and visual storytelling. This simple scene of a man firing a gun may seem ordinary now, but that's because because he made it ordinary. The bullet hits the guy's head, the gun goes up in recoil, the shell comes out. He does it all in one panel. Because of Fireball, now everyone draws this way. And I mean absolutely everyone, including myself. It opened the door. It was the beginning of the manga of our age. But here's the most important lesson. What Otomo taught me is, if there's something your artistic sensibility tells you to do, you've got to speak out. This is a pretty small example, but when I was doing this talk with Otomo as part of an ad campaign for the film adaptation of Spriggan, the cameraman asked us to pose with our fists raised, to which Otomo replied, let's not, and the cameraman backed right off the idea. Until then, I'd always done as I was told, so I was surprised at how easily he just shut it down. All it took was the let's not, and we didn't have to do it. It was actually Otomo's pre-Akira work that resonated with him the most. Akira was designed to appeal to a wider demographic. Urasawa supports this decision and thinks it was smart, but it just didn't impact him the same way. He admired many other artists too, some of which also showed him that it's okay to break the rules. 
Fujio Akatsuka, Hadanori Yoku, Shotaro Ishinomori, Taro Okamoto, and more. Despite this passion for manga, Urasawa didn't want to become a mangaka. He graduated from Meisei University with a degree in economics. He went in for an interview with Chogakukan one day, for a business role of course. As Urasawa is about to finish university, he starts job hunting. The places he's applying happen to include Shogakukan. Since I was going to interviews with publishers anyway, I might as well ask a professional to look at the manuscripts I had been working on. A youth Sunday editor there didn't care for his work, but as he was leaving, the chief editor of Big Comic Original passed by and took a look. He said, this is better suited for Big Comic, not Youth Sunday. He takes Urasawa over to the Big Comic Spirits editing department and gets him to enter a 1982 new manga artist competition, a contest he ended up winning with an unpublished work called Return. Urasawa couldn't believe it. This was the first time he seriously considered pursuing manga professionally, and he decided to give it a try for about a year. The key limitation and strength of Urasawa's early manga style was its niche appeal. This is a big reason why it wouldn't have worked in Youth Sunday, and it's also part of why he didn't want to make a career out of manga. In order to sell commercially successful work, you need to design stories meant to be commercially successful. Mainstream, if you will. Exceptions apply. When the editor looked at the manuscript I submitted, they pointed out things I had already critiqued myself. It was like, even after hearing a professional's opinion, I still think the same. No matter how many storyboards I submitted, they'd say things like, why are you always so niche? And I'd just think, well, because I am niche. A year after winning that award, Urasawa kept on with his manga career. This was when he met Takashi Nagasaki, who seems to have helped him break out of that niche a little. Nagasaki is a very important contributor to most of Urasawa's works. He serves this unique role of editor, collaborator, and co-writer. His name is actually on all of these. Someone told us, you two weirdos should team up. So when he asked me, do you have any ideas? I said, I've been thinking of a story where someone wakes up as Ultraman but dies after three minutes. And he said, that's interesting. A pretty awful story, really. I thought it was strange that someone would find that interesting, but here we are, still working together after 25 years. Urasawa did some assistant work under Toshio Nobe for less than a year at some point, after which he made his professional debut. I'm going to quickly summarize the journey to Monster, then discuss a few of them in more detail. What you're going to notice is that Urasawa eventually goes insane and starts drawing two serializations at the same time. Here we go. He started out with a niche comedy one-shot called Beta then a short comedy series, Dancing Policeman. A longer military action story, Pineapple Army. Partway through that one, he starts the judo manga, Yawara. Once Pineapple Army ends, the mystery series, Master Keaton, begins. When one sports manga ends, the tennis drama, Happy, begins. There's also a short Yawara spin-off in there, and a collection of short stories called NASA. The individual stories in this collection were written at different times throughout all of this. For Pineapple Army, Urasawa mainly did the art. It was written by Kazuya Kudo, and Urasawa credits Nagasaki for coming up with the original premise. It follows Jed, a former US Marine and Merc, who now spends his time training others and sometimes saving the world. This manga directly influenced Urasawa's protagonist choice for his next work, Master Keaton. He didn't like how Jed was basically a master of explosives that could win by destroying his enemies. So he decided to contrast this by having Taichi Keaton be a clever and intelligent insurance investigator who solves mysteries around the world in an episodic format. In early Keaton volumes, Hokusei Katsushika and Takashi Nagasaki get story credit, while Urasawa gets art credit. But then in later volumes, Katsushika left the project and Urasawa now gets story credit. How that series came about is that I had an idea for the character and it was very much based on my idea for that. It was initially thought that I would come up with all the stories as well, but at the time, I was still working on Yawara, so the editorial team was slightly concerned. He's still in his 20s, would he have time to come up with both stories and finish both manga? We don't think so, so let's bring in some story writers. There were conflicts between what Urusawa envisioned and what the stories were turning out to be, hence the breakup. Yawara was considered to be Urasawa's rise into the mainstream. It's also the name of the protagonist, a young girl who wants to be normal, but is forced to intensely practice judo by her grandfather. The idea for this series came about on a whim. There is no logic in it at all. I didn't have any particular interest in judo either. How about something like women's judo, I heard myself asking without knowing why. The words just sort of fell out of my mouth. Then the expression on the editor's face was suddenly transformed. 
He said it sounded interesting, so then I scribbled out the whole comic from the story down to the characters. He decided to go through with the series because women's judo wasn't a popular sport. It gave him a chance to show off his range. From my perspective, Yawara was an exercise in figuring out what kind of structure makes a hit manga. In a way, I was critiquing manga through manga. Even though he started stepping into mainstream writing, he'd try to incorporate his niche style into the work. I think the fact that a work like 20th Century Boys became so widely accepted is the result of how much time I spent gradually making niche elements more familiar to the general public. What's really cool about Yawara's production is that it was kind of a race and bet against time. The story's endgame involves Yawara competing in judo at the Olympics. However, women's judo didn't become an official Olympic sport until the 1992 games in Barcelona. The manga started well before that. Judo was going to become a demonstration sport in the 1988 Olympics. So Urusawa had to imagine this future event, then bet on it becoming an official sport in the 92 Olympics. All while writing the series in real time leading up to that event. Urasawa was more aggressive with the niche elements in Happy. It's a depressing series about a girl who has to excel in tennis in order to avoid prostitution. I wanted to create a story that was a bit wild. At the time, I felt that I was being considered too serious, so I was looking for a way to express my true nature. But it's very difficult to reveal it, and it's also embarrassing. I read it again after a long time to publish the deluxe edition, and I was so moved that I was surprised by my own emotion. This one wasn't so well received, and sales eventually plummeted. The public wanted something more like Yawara. There's a particular review of Happy that hit Urasawa hard. It said, the only person who hasn't given up on this manga is Urasawa. But he fought for happy and saw it through to the end. I believed in the interest and quality of this manga. And most people didn't like the plot. But when I was working on happy, I wondered why people didn't realize it was a good manga full of qualities. We've already seen Urasawa challenging editors and breaking norms. But he also just straight up broke Shugaku-kun's format a couple times. Pineapple Army's cover is a photo of a model gun. It doesn't feature characters. Dancing Policeman's cover took inspiration from American art books. He did Yawara's color pages in green and blue, while Shogaku-kan would have everyone use red and black normally. Then he ditched color altogether near the end of the series. To conclude, why is it that Urasawa keeps making manga non-stop? I would definitely prefer not to have to keep going from deadline to deadline. It feels like the hurdles I have to clear just keep going on and on forever, and I'd like to be able to stop. The problem is, if I do stop, I don't think I'd ever be able to come back. As 1994 came to an end, we got a series that was kind of a long time coming. Around 1986, Urasawa proposed a story featuring a character in the medical field. Due to the subject matter, the editor he met with was very cautious about the idea. I could tell that the editor's face was very stern, and he didn't look very happy. So I actually said as a joke, why don't I write something about women's judo? And then he looked up with that sparkle in his eyes, like, oh really? Which would lead us back to Yawara. The idea was sort of revisited about 8 years later. Mr. Takashi Nagasaki, who was my former editor and later became became my co-writer, came back to work with me. He asked me what I was planning to do after Master Keaton. At that moment, I told him I wanted to create something like the American TV series The Fugitive. He completely agreed with me, and we decided to meet again in a week with our ideas. Urasawa first watched The Fugitive at around age 8. It was another one of those darker works that left an impression on him. The story follows a doctor wrongfully convicted of his wife's murder. After escaping en route to death row, he embarks on a nationwide hunt for the true killer, while being pursued by the police. Sounds a little familiar, right? Urasawa didn't want to make Tenma a doctor initially, but he and Nagasaki agreed that the protagonist needed that profession. He then drew inspiration from Astro Boy and Frankenstein to further shape the story. Astro Boy's Dr. Tenma creates a robot who is good, but what if he accidentally made something evil instead? Something like Frankenstein's Monster, which is where the title of the work comes from. Monster doesn't have actual monsters in the conventional sense, but in Mary Shelley's original work, Frankenstein's Monster was born against his will, created by humans and hated by all. These were the elements he was thinking of as he developed this manga. The editorial team strongly opposed the idea for Monster. They didn't think a mystery story involving a doctor would ever work. Urasawa wouldn't go down without a fight. I was absolutely convinced it would be a hit, and that it was interesting. The challenge was figuring out how to communicate that to others. I thought that if I introduced a handsome young man, it might elicit a strong reaction from a wide audience. That's why I created the character 
murderer of Johan. Shogaku-kan eventually let Urasawa try this, but they wanted the series to be at most 4 volumes, still convinced it would flop. Urasawa agreed and made an alternate ending that would let him end the series in 4 volumes, but he didn't intend on using it. He believed in the idea and took it very seriously. Urasawa outlines most of his works using the same approach. When I start a new project, I start with a larger arc of the story. I visualize a movie trailer for that story, and after I compose this movie trailer in my mind, there comes a point where I'm so excited about it that I have to write the story, and then I imagine, where do I begin to tell this narrative? And that's usually the first chapter. He then lets the story tell him where to go next. Sometimes it pulls him in unexpected directions, and even he's surprised by the plot twists. I think if I tried to design a manga with each detail of the story planned out from the beginning, there's no way I could create something that would last 5-7 to seven years. There might be a scene I envision as I begin the project, something from that trailer I visualized, but that scene might show up 5 years later as I'm illustrating the manga. The end goal, however, does need to be established. If I don't see the end myself, I don't start the series. Writing is like a journey. I move towards the destination, but as the journey progresses, I grow and evolve with the characters. I set the destination from the beginning, but along the way, there are lots of twists and changes, which happens to me quite often. Monster was one of those series where the last panel changed. I thought the final scene would be the twins saying welcome home and I'm home to each other, but when I actually drew it, I realized it wasn't the ending. The series debuted in late 1994 with Happy still ongoing. We first set the stage in Dusseldorf. Urasawa decided to set the story in Germany due to how much influence it had on Japan's medical industry. He started the story in the Cold War era so that the time period would align with his plan to weave the neo-Nazi movement into the story. For Monster, it was a week of research starting in Munich, to Dresden, and then to Prague. While traveling, I expanded on the story. I tend to read foreign novels and watch foreign films, rather than Japanese contents. And when I watch international news or foreign films, I often find people whose looks I might use in my manga. Tenma follows the pattern of how Urasawa generally treats men and protagonists in his stories. I don't often feature strong-willed men, but my characters often end up becoming very strong. In short, my stories are coming-of-age tales. Unfortunately, men are hopeless cases. In fact, they don't evolve in the slightest. A lot of his protagonists also have strained family relationships. This may be a result of Urasawa's own family dynamics growing up. When I was a child, my father and mother separated temporarily, and I was raised by my mother in a single parent household. But at some point, my mother ended up going back to my father, and during that period, I was a bit hurt. You can still feel a kind of scar from it. I don't remember being raised in a warm environment. He also lived with his grandparents for a short while. Urasawa's protagonists often have a Japanese connection, even when the story is set abroad. I create manga primarily for a Japanese audience, and for them to identify with the characters, I need to give them a connection to Japan. At the same time, perhaps I, as a Japanese person, put myself in that context. I would understand characters of Japanese origin better. When the murders are introduced and Tenma is forced to flee, the mystery elements of Monster take center stage. However, Urasawa's interpretation of mystery is quite broad. I don't actually like those traditional mystery stories as in let's guess who's done this. The stories that would end with a detective going on and on about it, you know the ones. I believe the definition of mystery is much bigger than people think it is. For example, just a chance meeting between a man and a woman is a mystery in itself. So any story that draws people in, where there is a hinge, that is a mystery. As Tenma traverses through East Germany to Munich, the story will often shift focus away from the protagonist and develop supporting characters. If it were up to me, I would write stories without heroes, featuring only supporting characters. This shows just how possible it is to work solely with secondary characters. I think it's been since middle school that I've had trouble creating heroic characters. I find it hard to believe that such extraordinary men could exist. In my opinion, it's too good to be true. This results in character-focused stories that do an excellent job of depicting both the good and bad aspects of human nature. Despite his traumatic experiences, Dieter doesn't lose a sense of right and wrong. He serves as an interesting contrast to Johan. Since the day of my debut, everyone has always told me that I'm good at drawing children and the elderly. I find them interesting because they can't be at the center of society, probably due to the fact that they don't have much responsibility. They are forgiven even if they go too far in doing something. However, in the future, due to the aging population, I think this theory of mine will change. Officer Lunge seems to take inspiration from Police Lieutenant Philip Gerard from the Fugitive TV series. Kind of looks like him too. Gerard relentlessly pursues Dr. Kimball from that show. 
Initially, it didn't matter whether the doctor was really guilty or innocent to him. He needed to track him down because it's his duty to enforce the law. The way the dynamic between Tenma and Lungay progresses is very similar to that of Gerard and Kimball. On Nina and Eva, all the women in my works, without exception, are incredibly strong. Do I have some kind of complex? Aside from that, all the women I know are really strong. I portray them exactly as I see them. I believe that those who depict sensuality are unruffled, free in some way, believing that sensuality is an art form. Unfortunately for me, I confess that I still feel a certain embarrassment. In Munich, we get this scene, which foreshadows the climax. I'm convinced one of these has to be one of those movie trailer scenes he envisions. I often ask myself, what is this scene? this grand image. So my attempt to understand it is like unraveling tangled threads. Sometimes, after several years, I complete the scene with a single image. At that moment, I realize that just understanding it was an incredible achievement. As Munich draws to a close, the attention is on three frogs, a bridge, and this picture book. The art Urasawa uses for Bonaparte's books is probably the furthest he's gone from his own style. It doesn't use a specific source of inspiration, but rather a general representation of European picture books that have strange atmospheres. Enter Wolfgang Grimmer. It's generally believed that this character was inspired by the Incredible Hulk. Whenever Dr. Banner experiences intense emotional stress, he involuntarily transforms into the Hulk. Urasawa twisted the idea by making Grimmer emotionally numb, while still having his magnificent Steiner persona come out in moments of extreme stress. This must have been an interesting character to draw, because one of Urasawa's strengths and focuses is character expressions. People are complicated, so to him, expressions shouldn't be so simple. He doesn't just want to depict anger, he wants a mix that includes sadness and something hard to explain, something that each reader will interpret differently. There are no identical faces in different situations, but instead, there are subtle changes that occur in a person's facial expression from moment to moment, and that's what I try to capture. One time, I gave a lecture at a university, and it was an arts-focused institution, and I told the students, if you really want to understand how to create manga, you shouldn't go to art school first. You should take drama classes first and learn to understand human emotions and expressions before trying to step into the world of manga. Urasawa will even include expressions in his preliminary storyboards. Here's an example from the Nemu for the final chapter of Monster, the scene on the bench. He'll redo the same page several times to try out different layouts and pacing. What's very important for me is the flow of expressions. It's what creates the connections between the pages. Even I never draw the same expression twice. It's always different. When it comes to the anime adaptation of Monster, Urasawa took part in a lot of meetings in the early stages before he eventually left it up to the anime staff. It's important to note that Naoki Urasawa's directives were very precise, especially for Tenma. After a certain point of the series, he had to hold himself with his head down and a slouched back. It's those kinds of instructions that were passed on to the whole staff. That's why the series is uniform. Masao Maruyama has been a constant presence in all of Urasawa's anime adaptations. He understands the difficulties of producing these very well. To Maruyama, the fact that they were able to adapt Monster into a 74 episode series was a miracle in itself. He didn't want to make many changes too. It had to adapt everything and be faithful to the original source. And finally, when it comes to Urasawa's endings, they aren't always well received. I think what I want to say is all in the manga. The readers actually reading it and feeling something in their heart is what I want to say. There are some trolls online who criticize the manga, but even they say that they've read it to the very end. I feel like it's not resolved. He's not giving me the answer, but he's doing it on purpose really, just to make it not too obvious. Urasawa addresses this by referencing a Bob Dylan song called Like a Rolling Stone. It has this lyric. How does it feel? I think that epitomizes my work, really. Because I'm not trying to tell the readers about the ending or the conclusion. It's more that I'm throwing a question at them. How does it feel? As Happy wrapped up and Monster started to enter its endgame, Urasawa became fed up with his hectic schedule. He decided to never work on a weekly series again. After the team celebrates Happy's conclusion, he slips into the bath to relax. That's when an idea pops up. Some person, like a UN general, says the phrase, if it weren't for them, we would not have reached the 21st century. He got out of there as soon as he could to write this down. I heard the sound of cheering, and then they appeared, followed by the title 20th Century Boys flashing dramatically, while T 
Rex's song 20th Century Boy started playing in my mind. He writes this phrase alongside the idea on a sheet of paper, then faxes it over to the Spirit's editorial team. Urasawa didn't know what this team was going to battle against yet, but once Nagasaki saw the fax, he came over to Urasawa's house and said, The enemy is the head of this cult sect. Urasawa's response, That's gonna be too complicated, I don't wanna work on that. Nagasaki, let's talk in a week. When the two met up again, Urasawa told Nagasaki that he's not gonna do this story. However, he thinks that the name of the leader of the sect is Friend. Nagasaki was convinced this was going to be a hit. This was around 1998, and thinking about that line from the UN Secretary General, I realized, if this story is going to happen, it has to start within the 20th century, meaning it needs to begin in the 1990s. I thought, I have to start this right away. And here we go again. I've basically explained the premise already. 20th Century Boys is about a group of childhood friends unraveling the mystery surrounding this organization and its leader. A mystery that somehow connects back to their pasts when they were kids. The manga expresses several aspects of Urasawa's own childhood growing up, including his personal connection to rock music. He started playing the guitar in middle school, around the same time he discovered Bob Dylan. This guy's a major figure in folk, rock, and country music, but he didn't adopt electrically amplified rock until around 1965. This resulted in a lot of controversy and criticism from fans of his folk music. Concerts would sometimes turn hostile, but despite that, Bob Dylan continued to sing rock. This gets into the deeper side of his impact on Urasawa. The most rock and roll musician in the world, in my opinion, is Bob Dylan. Every time I see him, he's changed. He's different. That's very rock. Thanks to Bob Dylan, I've learned the rock way of living. Because of him, my life has been joyful. He's influenced me a lot. But how do you even express music in a sci-fi mystery drama like 20th CB? Expressing something musical in manga is actually a very risky thing to do. The moment you draw something like passion for rock, it risks no longer being rock. In 20th Century Boys, music itself is hardly ever directly expressed. I presented it from a completely different angle, not as a music-focused manga, because that's when I thought it could start to feel like rock. It expresses rock in this deeply twisted, layered way. Urasawa often quotes 20th CB as being about 10% autobiographical, playing T-Rex in the school, the reason I started guitar. The manga is based on a lot of these personal experiences. On that T-Rex bit, Urasawa once took a vinyl record into his school's radio room and played rock music throughout the building. He wanted to create chaos, but the other students didn't react at all. The song he decided to play was 20th Century Boy. Kenji, the protagonist of the series, doesn't take much inspiration from Urasawa. The character is much more sociable, had a happier childhood, and is much more attached to the dream of being a rock star than he is. The idea was to make him someone who could be easy to like. Our personalities are totally different. Actually, I feel that I connect more with Ocho, but I can also understand how Yoshitsune and Friend feel to a certain degree. When it comes to the character's emotions, Kenji is the last one I can relate to. If there's a part of me in Kenji, you might see him in that older version, when he's seen a few more things in life. I think I'm more on the cynical side. This is what Urasawa's studio looked like during Monster, 20th CB, and Pluto. It's a relaxed atmosphere where he and his five assistants joke around all the time. He often has rock music playing in the background as he spends over 10 hours a day on just drawing. Look at how much fun they're having, making manga is such a fun time. Urasawa's assistants handle the backgrounds and he'll go over what they need to do very closely. When I ask my assistants to create a background, the biggest challenge is figuring out how to convey what's in my mind to them. Most of the time, I have them redo the drawings countless times. Not because their technique is bad, but because I'm not getting the image I want. It's obvious that I can't make it work on the first try. That's why I make sure to give them the most precise outline of my idea with very clear instructions. Coming back to character expressions, here's an example of Urasawa drawing one. As he draws, he says this. I like the face I drew. He may feel sorrow, relief, agony, or a feeling that we can't really identify. We can interpret it however we want. It's these kinds of successful faces that I want to draw. Men aren't very simple, you know. We'll come back to the studio and I'll show you what a typical week looks like in the next section. These days, Urasawa doesn't need to think about visual pacing much. When I start to structure a story narratively, the question of tempo, developing a character moment to moment, and then jumping to a two-page spread, how do you determine where that happens? It's like breathing to me. I know when it feels right. But as we discussed before, when Urasawa's playing the long game, he sometimes surprises himself. Chapter 1 of 20th CB depicts a scene where this girl pulls away a curtain to reveal a robot. We won't understand who this girl is or what this scene means for a long time. Urasawa also didn't know who this girl would end up being. 
He saw this scene in one of his movie trailer visualizations and added it in. He later surprised himself when he developed the twist that's revealed in chapter 50. The Japan World Exposition of 1970 is a major event in 20th CB. It's also a real world event that attracted worldwide attention, even having the same theme, progress and harmony for mankind. Urasawa was in 5th grade when this expo happened, and just like Kenji, he couldn't go. He really wanted to be there, but his parents said it was too expensive and there were too many people. Yet if you were to ask me why I absolutely had to go, I have a hard time coming up with a clear answer. In the manga, there are scenes of characters discussing how they had to see the moon rock, or whatever cool thing at each pavilion. I'm the same way, simply listing off the things I wanted to see. But that's not the reason I wanted to see them. It's difficult to consolidate the intensity of the expo. 20th Century Boys marks my attempt to. Beyond 20th CB, many of Urasawa's works use a style of storytelling where chance encounters and random meetings between two parties can have unexpected consequences years down the road on other characters. To him, world history in general is a large combination of these elements. Urasawa extends this idea further by having his protagonists age over the course of his series. He thinks that one of the most interesting themes of his work has to do with how people change over time. At what point do human beings turn towards evil? No child sets out to become evil. They all love heroes. So, when does everything start to go wrong? When someone is considered evil, it's the others who see them that way, while they believe that what they are doing is just. They're not even trying to be evil. I wondered, where does evil come from? He also makes the point that the notion of what is good and what is evil changes over time. Kenji is an example of this. At one point in the story, he's seen as a bad person, but at another, he's seen as good and just. He depicts the two states as two different eras. As 20th CB was reaching its climax in April 2006, Urasawa's health finally caught up to him. He injured his left shoulder so severely that his publications had to be put on hold. It was so bad that this person, who I think may be his physiotherapist, said this. As his whole body was deformed, his two shoulders could no longer support this kind of deformed movement, which explains why his left shoulder became disarticulated. In general, athletes are forced to retire when their bodies are in this state. You can imagine my surprise when I learned that Mr. Urasawa was drawing with a body in such a state. He returned to work in September 2006. The series was relaunched under the name 21st Century Boys. However, getting back into writing manga was difficult. Just as he'd feared, stopping, then having to resume made him feel incredibly uncomfortable. Urasawa felt at odds with his readers. They were growing more critical of the series, and had been disappointed due to the pause already. He also didn't like where the reader's focus was. I never wrote and drew this manga with the idea of making friends' identity a main issue, you know. But readers thought it was the main issue. A lot of them get upset if the story story doesn't evolve the way they wanted it to. We have some footage of the first meeting back between Urasawa and Nagasaki, where they discuss how the first chapter of 21st CB should begin. I'm briefly going into major spoilers here, skip to this section if that matters. Urasawa wanted to start the chapter by featuring Kenji. He would have a double page where Kenji is walking towards the reader. Nagasaki thought that the chapter should begin with friend's death. He was worried about the readers and thought this would be a good way to give them something they were interested in. It looks like the result we got was sort of a compromise. The chapter does start on Kenji, but it moves quickly into the action and the focus falls on friend. To be honest, I'm not thinking about the readers too much as I'm creating. I just try to tell a story that I find interesting myself, and as a result, if I stay interested and if I'm having fun, the reader reaction will hopefully follow along. As always, Urasawa finished the story in the direction he wanted. He particularly cherishes a quote from a Bob Dylan song. Boy, go and follow your heart, and you'll be fine at the end of the line. To conclude this segment, I need to talk about Urasawa's music career. This man is the vocalist and guitarist of his own band. He performs under the stage name Bob Lennon, which is also the name of Kenji's song from the manga. When 20th Century Boys was about to end, I realized I'd soon have only one ongoing series, so I thought I might have the time to do something else. Around that time, I also met Koji Wakui, and this long-standing desire to create an album finally became a reality. The way that the song Bob Lennon came about is incredible. In 2001, Urasawa was about to work on a chapter that involves a certain robot making a move. It would have resulted in the Shinjuku skyscrapers collapsing. Unfortunately, September 11th, 2001 arrived, and Urasawa felt that he could no longer draw this. That night, while I was out walking my dog, I suddenly smelled curry from somewhere. 
and it made me feel incredibly lonely. Suddenly, the melody came to me. I went home and recorded it in a sketch-like manner. I thought maybe I could continue the manga if I had Kenji sing that song. This scene in chapter 79 is something Urasawa would normally never do, putting lyrics into a manga. But this was supposed to be a tribute, so we wrote it out properly. The song is full of mourning, but I wanted to incorporate it into the 20th Century Boy's story and make it work, while also portraying a stance of not yielding to terrorism. Thanks to that, I was able to continue drawing 20th Century Boys. Otherwise, the real world and the drama in the manga would have overlapped too much, and I wouldn't have felt like continuing. Here's a taste of Urasawa performing that song himself. <laughs> Let's go back to that volume of Astro Boy from Urasawa's grandparents' place. It was a story called The Greatest Robot on Earth. Pluto is a reinterpretation of this story. It's turned into a darker mystery series that follows Gesit, a robot detective trying to get to the bottom of a series of murders, both robot and human. Tezuka originally set Adam's birth date to be in the far future of April 2003. As that day approached, Tezuka Productions encouraged the manga industry to do something special to commemorate the event. Urasawa expected most people would make a drawing or something like that. So when he met with his editors about it, he asked, Is there any manga artist with the guts to remake the greatest robot on Earth? To which they responded, You can do it yourself. He was very against it. But after hearing about this incident, Nagasaki took another trip to Urasawa's place. It turns out that both of them were big fans of greatest robot on Earth. So they started talking about the idea. They thought Gesicht was really cool and that it would be interesting to tell the story from his perspective. As the conversation went on, they ended up developing a narrative that was so interesting that Urasawa felt he couldn't let go of it. Here we go again. Urasawa drew out some fragments of the story he had in mind in the form of rough sketches, then sent them to Osamu Tezuka's son, Makoto Tezuka. Over six months later, Makoto got back to him and invited Urasawa for dinner, which was where permission was officially granted. We got to hear Makoto's version of this story in Volume 2 of Pluto, which is slightly different. According to him, he initially turned Urasawa down, thinking it was too soon to do something like this. He was also concerned that it might be seen as an attempt to capitalize on the astro boom of the time, as he calls it. But Urasawa didn't give up. He wanted to discuss this further and show sketches to better convey his idea. After careful consideration, Makoto decided to meet with Urasawa, Nagasaki, and a few others in March 2003. Both Makoto and Urasawa's recounts mentioned problems with the first draft of character designs. When Urasawa made his initial sketches, he tried to replicate Tezuka's style in an effort to stay faithful to the original work. But Makoto didn't like that. I had no intention of gleefully giving him the go-ahead right then and there, no matter what he said. So I insisted on one condition. I made him promise that he would create the work in his own style and make it his own work. I said this because the initial character designs and sketches Mr. Urasawa showed me betrayed a certain deference to Tezuka's work and looked more like an imitation. Adam would be immediately recognizable by anyone as Adam, and Gesicht had the same face that Tezuka had used in his original manga. After getting permission to proceed, Urasawa started getting cold feet again. To understand why this task feels so impossible to accomplish, you need to understand what this Astro Boy arc means to Urasawa. Greatest Robot on Earth was the saddest, most impactful work he had read up until he discovered Phoenix. He has a hard time describing why, but it has to do with how this isn't your typical good versus evil story, and how uncomfortable the ending made him feel. These days, he no longer thinks it's all that heartbreaking. But imagine getting the chance to remake the works you've been admiring since you were four. The thing you thought was unsurpassable and set you on your manga creation journey. Naturally, Urusawa felt physically sick and even broke into hives, which lingered on for a good chunk of Pluto's run. There was also the question of whether his body could handle it. His health was deteriorating at the time, leading to that eventual shoulder injury. Fortunately, he got permission to serialize Pluto once a month instead of every two weeks. Above all, Urasawa holds himself to an incredibly high standard. He's constantly trying to reach the level of Tezuka. And in the case of Pluto, there would be no harsher critic than the younger version of himself, which just piled on more stress. Even so, he made full use of the lack of creative restrictions and went on to write a story the way he wanted. The one thing he was careful to preserve were the feelings and value the original gave to him. 
Tezuka's work generally gets seen as lighthearted and family friendly, partially due to how adaptations of his work were treated and partially due to his art style. Urasawa disagrees. His work has sort of been reimagined as this very wholesome and safe content, but if you really look at Tezuka's work on a deeper level, it's very dark. If you aim to properly adapt or remake any of Tezuka's work, you will naturally end up with a very dark story. You know when you rewatch something you really liked as a kid and realize there are scenes or pieces of dialogue you thought existed that really didn't? Urasawa experienced that with Greatest Robot. Such experiences became natural expansions on the story for Pluto. The dialogue from this scene is one such example. Apart from maybe Adam and Gesicht, Urasawa didn't deliberately focus on fan favorites. I don't make much of a distinction between new characters and already existing ones. I never start by thinking about using an existing character. It's more the opposite. I have an idea for an interesting story, and maybe a particular existing character fits that idea. For me, that difference doesn't really matter. You'll notice that when Urasawa designed the non-human looking robots, they've got a more old school look to them. This is because he feels hesitant when it comes to drawing sci-fi elements. It's like, there are people who specialize in doing that, designing robots and stuff. That's how it was for me when I was doing robots for Pluto. They asked me, what are you going to do about the robots? Yeah, and I got really neurotic about that. But then I was like, whatever. I used to draw Tetsujin 28 back when I was in grade school. I was defiant and decided that I'd just go with that. I'd design it to look like that and get a few laughs out of people. Seems like he went with a similar approach for 20th CB. We now return to the studio to walk through the typical development cycle for a chapter. Urasawa begins by meeting with Nagasaki. It's through these meetings where the two develop the story's conflicts, flesh out details, and inspire new ideas. In this particular meeting, they're discussing the pacing of the next chapter. They agree to a structure where it starts slow and speeds up in the second part. Once the scenario is well defined, Urasawa spends the next two days working on the most challenging part of the process. Storyboarding. The atmosphere here is completely different. He locks himself up alone and won't listen to any music. Look at his face. The smiles are all gone. Making manga is such a miserable time. I'm joking, he's just focusing intensely. But storyboarding really can be dreadful sometimes. It isn't just about drawing. It's testing the artist's understanding of pacing, dialogue, emotion, composition, and cinematography. Urasawa decides how he wants to place panels, what angles to use for specific scenes, and more. Once finished, the storyboard is faxed over to Nagasaki for review. The next day, his assistants return, the music's turned back on, and we're all happy again. The following five days will be spent drawing out a 24-page chapter. This stage isn't always easy either, because Urasawa pays close attention to the details. Here's an example. He's drawing what looks to be the final pages of chapter 35. It's where Gesik returns to fulfill his duty after learning a harsh truth. Urasawa spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to depict his gate. I still don't know which of these drawings better translates determination in his approach. And then for the same chapter, there's a scene where Gesik places his hand on a desk, angry that the media has been made aware of his involvement in a certain case. The original version of this panel looked like this, where he angrily slams his hand down. Nagasaki called the team just 30 hours before the chapter was due, concerned that this desk slam was too human of a behavior. Urasawa agrees and redraws the already completed panel. On the day of the deadline, it's a rush to get it finished. An editor arrives at 10pm to pick it up. Urasawa will often cut it close, but he's pretty good at meeting his deadlines. The way he handles making two manga at once is that one of them will be a weekly serialization, while the other is semi-monthly. He will alternate work between them in a cycle. An example he once gave was this. Six deadlines a month, until Pluto relaxed that a bit. When asked how he can make such high quality work as if he was a machine, Urasawa had an interesting response. It's fear. The fear of taking shortcuts that could cause me to fall. To escape this fear, I need to focus and take care of each chapter one at a time. Without going into detail, Pluto has a lot of sad elements. A common trait among Urasawa works. It's not that I focus on sad stories. It's more that I feel like when you focus on humans and the core of what humans are about, then that's just what tends to come out as the outcome. He also likes to add humor to his stories. It's most easily seen in characters like Kyoko from 20th CB and Jackie from Billy Bat. But Urasawa's definition of comedy is also broad. Everything makes me laugh. People's gestures, their tics, everything. What seems trivial makes me laugh. I used to observe these little things, and people would tell me that I was a bit mocking. 
In fact, I believe there's a strong connection between the words humor and human, meaning that when we think of humor, we imagine things that make us laugh, and when we observe humans, it ultimately makes us smile. The details of every human action make me laugh. Many people see Monster, 20th Century Boys, and Billy Bat as very serious series. But for me, there's a lot of humor in them, and when I draw those pages, there are many moments where the characters make me laugh. He once shared a Charlie Chaplin quote that he says is in line with his beliefs. Life is a tragedy when seen up close, but a comedy in the long shot. Consuming Pluto in the modern day, Urasawa's depiction of artificial intelligence and robots can't be ignored. Robots dreaming, feeling emotions. Looking back at Pluto today, Urasawa feels that he wasn't so off the mark when it comes to conflicts involving AI. The rapid evolution, surpassing human expectations, is something quite frightening. I can't help but wonder what the future holds. At first, I had a rather negative view of AI, but the other day, I saw some AI-generated artwork, and I actually found myself thinking, that's a really good line. The moment I thought, that's a nice line, I got chills. I was like, did I really just appreciate an AI-generated line? If modern day models are starting to impress artists, things are indeed starting to get scary. Let's wrap this up with a discussion on the anime. Animators have been trying to adapt Pluto for a very long time. Every time a project started up, it would fizzle out. But leave it to Maruyama and his new studio M2 to once again get the job done. He kept telling Urasawa that they're going to make it no matter what. Even saying things like, I won't die until we make Pluto, and I'm going to die soon so we need to hurry up and make it. Urasawa fully understood the challenge the animation team was up against better than anyone. They were probably going to feel the same way he did when he started the manga. From my perspective, it feels like I've already climbed a steep mountain peak, having gone through the experience once. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's like saying, are you really going to climb that mountain again? Urasawa was involved right from the story planning stage. He offered advice on what had to be kept and what could be cut as well as directions on character and art design. Things like posture and facial expressions matter to him, of course. Urasawa was also involved in the creation process of two songs from the anime, Mother's Humming Song and Duncan's Piano Piece. He created a demo recording for them, conveying the rough idea he had in mind. Though the creative process for these started before the manga even finished. Back when I was working on the manga, I couldn't bring the scenes to life without having some idea of the music, so I roughly imagined the songs as I created the landscapes and characters. According to Maruyama, it took 10 years to go from the beginning of the planning stage to the anime becoming real. The original story is already perfect, so deciding what to cut out was the hardest thing to tackle for myself. Naoki Urasawa was very happy with what he saw and what we brought to the table, so I think in terms of cutting things out, we did a good job. We just took out the small bits that would work in manga but not animation. Despite finding the 8 episode structure to be restrictive, they managed to pull off a great adaptation. But these comments make it apparent that adapting Urasawa's remaining work to the same level of quality would probably be much more challenging. Same idea, let's run through Urasawa's more recent works. Shortly after 20th CB ended, the historical supernatural mystery series Billy Bat started. Pluto ends the year after, which was when a 20th CB spin-off was published. An unexpected sequel, Master Keaton Remaster, ran a couple years later. Once the bat wrapped up, we got a short mystery drama Mujirushi. As that ends, another historical mystery drama begins. Asadora is still ongoing today. Urasawa was occasionally putting out more one-shots since the beginning of Monster. These were compiled into a book called Sneeze. I'll talk about the big ones here in more detail. First up is Billy Bat. This is a really cool story. It unfortunately doesn't have an official English release yet, but I think I have enough research to have given it its own section in this video. I might revisit it if enough people want it. The manga primarily follows comic artist Kevin Yamagata, creator of the detective series Billy Bat. He learns that he may have plagiarized his Bat character and decides to look into it. But in classic Urasawa fashion, he finds himself caught up in something that's much bigger than where we started. The idea for Billy Bat comes from Urasawa thinking about iconic characters that can be recognized anywhere you go in the world. All you need to do is see their silhouette, and you know who that is. Pikachu, Mickey Mouse, Jerry. If you know, you know. They can be found all over the world, even in the Amazon rainforest or on the bags of women walking on the Champs-Élysées. These are incredibly famous icons. I wondered where these characters come from and who created them. Sometimes I think maybe it wasn't a human who created this character. Maybe it came from... Or maybe... 
I was thinking about all these possibilities regarding the origin of these globally recognizable icons. I'm going to spoil the first two chapters and only those two. Skip ahead if that matters. Urasawa attempts to fake out the reader right from the beginning. The entirety of chapter 1 is this unexpected storyline about a cartoon bat, and the author listed is Kevin Yamagata, not Urasawa. But it all makes sense in chapter 2, when we see we were actually just reading a comic within a comic. Apparently a lot of adults were fooled by this, and maybe even an editor-in-chief according to Urasawa. That part lasts 24 pages, and when I read it recently in volume form, I found it really quite long. And I say this as the guy who drew it. It felt like I kept it going for a little long, but I do think it worked well enough. It was Erge and early Tezuka that I was channeling when I drew that part. Tezuka's art back then was just lovely. Master Keaton Remaster was never something Urasawa considered until around 2011. When he finishes a story, he does so with no intention of a continuation. He wasn't completely against it though, since he couldn't tell the story the way he wanted to from the beginning last time. But there was a bigger component to it. After the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, I went to visit the afflicted areas. People I met, victims of the disaster, told me how much they always liked Master Keaton as a character. I wanted to do something for them, to cheer them up, so I decided to bring him back. With that, we got a continuation of the story with a sequel set 20 years after the events of the original. Muji Rushi follows a man and his daughter as they encounter a francophile who persuades them to join a painting heist at La Louvre in Paris. This museum actually contacted Urasawa around 2013-ish, wanting to collaborate on something. The actual work started only after Urasawa finished Billy Bat at his request. The francophile character he uses is called Iyami, and he's actually the creation of the famous manga duo Fujio Akatsuka and Kenichiro Takai. The idea of using Iyami came from Urasawa just not wanting to go to France during the winter for research. Iyami has never been to France, but he repeatedly claims that he has. This allowed him to begin developing the story without actually going to France just yet. It also gave the story a Japanese connection. Getting permission to use Iyami seems like it was much easier than with Greatest Robot. He contacted Fujio Akatsuka's daughter, who said yes without hesitation. And finally, Asadora. The story starts with a girl who ends up getting kidnapped when trying to find help for her mother. But it turns into a much bigger story spanning many years once again. Like with the Keaton remaster, Asadora's origin started with the Japan earthquake of 2011. I didn't want to create a dark oppressive story. Instead, I wanted to depict a protagonist who could offer readers a sense of hope and strength to live. Naturally, that led me to create a female character. In my case, whether it's monster or 20th century boys, when I write about boys, the stories tend to take a darker turn. Bright and refreshing male protagonists often feel somewhat disingenuous to me. So, when I decided to write a story about a woman who lived through the post-war period, it hit me. Isn't this just like an Asadora? Then I thought, why not create my own version of an Asadora? And that's how Asadora got its name. It's a bit of a cheeky title, isn't it? The story features the Isle Bay Typhoon Incident of 1959, a real-life event where Typhoon Vera struck Japan, becoming the deadliest typhoon to make landfall on the country to date. Since he was born in 1960, Urasawa believes that the way his generation feels about that incident reflects how kids these days feel about the 2011 earthquake. It's something that they always heard stories about and wondered what it would have been like to live through. Looking back at the recent Urasawa works, you can see that he slowed down his pace. It takes quite a bit, one week to go from meeting with my editor to putting together a rough draft, and then another week to actually draw the thing. So, exactly two weeks. I can live something like a human life this way. Before, I was doing a weekly series and a bi-weekly series, which adds up to 6 chapters a month for 17 years. Really good call. Urasawa is 64 today, which puts him dangerously close to the age where a lot of mangaka have died. By his estimates, he was drawing 150 pages a month at his peak. Now he does about 48, though I bet he thinks that's nothing, cause he's heard that Tezuka could do 600 a month. This final quote is a bit old, but I don't think he'll ever change his mind. Drawing is a part of my daily life. For me, it's like eating or breathing. So, I can't make the decision to say I'll keep drawing for the rest of my life. It's like deciding to eat until the end of my life. If you like these manga artist videos, here's some more you might enjoy. And stay tuned for more. <coughs>